service model at CFF. We're excited to tell you more about it and also just go through some sort of general industry uh, updates that, um, yeah, are new in the sector. Um, but yeah, I, I'd like to, before we sort of get into anything, acknowledge country today. Um, so acknowledging traditional owners of the land on which we all are meeting in Australia and across the world today and to pay um, my respects to elders past and present. And I extend that respect and welcome to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples that might be joining us today or watching later. Next slide, I reckon, Tobes. Here's our super exciting disclaimer slide. Um, I'd invite you to have a bit of a read of this in detail at a later time if you'd like to. It is available on our website. Um, but essentially, CFF give general product Finan uh, general financial product advice only. Um, there's many factors, um, some of which we'll discuss today and many of which we won't, that can increase project feasibility. Um, and we do not accept liability for accuracy of any um, assessments made or advice given in this discussion today. Uh, you can read uh, more about this in the financial services guide available on our website at the link. Awesome. So as I mentioned today, we're going to talk through some industry updates and CFF's new service model. Um, you are joined today by myself, um, Roberta Atherton, or Bert, as I'm more commonly known, and my colleague, Toby. We are um, two project facilitators here at CFF, focused on helping landholders understand their carbon farming opportunities, assess feasibility, and get them ready to um, commence uh, establishing and registering their projects. Um, so on the agenda today, as I mentioned, updates in our new model, and then we'll also have a bit of a look at what's coming soon at CFF and have time to uh, have a bit of a Q&A. Uh, so thanks to those who have sent through questions in advance, um, some of which we will get to a bit later, a lot of which we hope to answer just through the content we go through today. If you have any questions that arise throughout um, watching the presentation, it would be great if you could just pop them into the chat and then we can address them at the end, as mentioned. Um, if you wouldn't mind just sort of keeping on mute throughout the duration of the presentation, uh, that would be great. And then we can have more of a chat at the end. Next, I reckon, Tobes. Cool. All right, so hi everybody, I'm Toby, as uh, Bert just mentioned, and I'm another project facilitator here. Um, just to quickly scoot through a few of the updates um, that have been happening with the Emission Reduction Fund of late and what we can see coming on the horizon. Um, to begin with, the uh, Integrated Farm Management Method, or the IFM, um, it's on its way here. Um, it, it, it essentially is looking to package up multiple existing methods um, under the ERF with a more sort of whole farm accounting approach and to streamline reporting and auditing requirements. Um, so very exciting when it does get here and we're all looking forward to it, um, but it is still on its way. Um, it's gonna be, when it is rolled out, it'll be rolled out in phases um, in terms of onboarding new activities. So phase one, um, we know is likely to include HIR, reforestation, soil carbon and fodder crops. Hey, Toby, uh, what's two. HIR? Sorry, HIR is human induced regeneration. Uh, it's been a little bit on the nose of late as we'll get into um, in the Chubb review, um, but it's not one of the core ones that the CFF are focused on as we're more focused on reforestation, soil carbon and plantation forestry. Um, and phase two will include um, plantation forestry, avoided clearing and livestock emission avoidance. Um, we're not totally sure of when it will be live. It was meant to be rolling out from Feb um, of this year, but we suspect that that's been delayed by the recent internal Chubb review. Um, but we're keeping close tabs on it and we'll keep all um, customers and clients who are interested in the loop on this. Uh, the next update is that the first round of the, uh, of the federal government's $50 million National Soil Innovation Challenge grant funding was announced back in November. Um, so nearly 30 mil was granted um, to eight innovative eight innovative projects across Australia that are working towards making soil carbon measurement easier and more accessible. Um, yeah, the, this was the first of a $50 million pool, as I mentioned, and um, the second round of funding is likely to be conducted some point this year. Um, notable mentions who were in those eight projects, um, a farm lab, 
who are a key partner of us um, here at CFF, and they are contributing members to several of the projects that received funding. Um, Honag and Carbon West, who we also collaborate with um, closely quite regularly, um, are also part of other projects that received some successful funding. Um, so hopefully there will be some big news surrounding reduced barriers to entry um, in the soil carbon field this year. So watch this space. Uh, another update is, as I just mentioned, that the Chubb review um, of the ERF's carbon crediting framework was delivered last week um, with more detail on the safeguard mechanism followed shortly behind, but Bert's going to deliver a whole other slide on that in just a second, so I'll leave that for her. Um, the ACU price has been slowly but surely climbing over the last few months. Uh, it's currently sitting at $36.75, which is the highest it's been in 11 months. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what impact the impending job review and safeguard mechanism changes will have upon this. I'll chuck it over to you, Bert, in the next slide. Thanks, Tobes. Um, sorry for the busy text on this one, but I suppose there is quite a lot of detail in terms of the two major policy reviews. Um, the impact the carbon market that were released last week, the Chubb review and the safeguard mechanism reform proposal from the government. Um, I am not going to get into too much detail here. Our CFF actually, have actually written a relatively succinct analysis blog focusing on major impacts for the sector, um, which I recommend you have a squiz at. It's in uh, the linked, um, yeah, the hyperlink on the bottom of this slide. It's also been sent out in our um, newsletter yesterday. Um, but essentially, at high level, the Chubb review was an independent review of the integrity of Australian carbon credit uni units, which is the um, unit under the ERF methodologies. Um, and the safeguard mechanism reform is uh, the government's proposal to strengthen Australia's primary emissions reductions policy, which covers um, 215 or so of our biggest polluting facilities. Um, and so in terms of the outcomes, the Chubb review um, found that ACUs were working um, as intended broadly. They recommended a number of measures to, bo uh, to boost confidence and integrity and transparency of the scheme as a whole, um, which have been welcomed almost universally and accepted by the government in principle. So it will now come down to sort of how those are implemented. Um, some methodological level critiques were accepted, including the avoided deforestation method, which will um, not accept any additional projects. Um, Toby mentioned human induced regeneration methodology. Um, there weren't sort of any major critiques of that um, that were founded according to Chubb. Um, yeah, there's several sort of methodological specific um, recommendations, which I won't really get into and which don't so much have relevance to our customers, given that the, we work on soil carbon native reforestation and plantation forestry projects, none of which were subject or uh, subject to any recommendations. Um, but yeah, some critiques certainly remain as to whether the Chubb review has gone far enough or reached into some of the issues that many would like to have seen um, looked at. But broadly, um, we can welcome the yeah the measures to boost integrity and confidence in the scheme. The safeguard mechanism, so the emissions reductions uh, proposal from the government, um, they are looking to implement stricter emissions reductions in the previous administration, um, becoming after sort of a year or two of operation, I think 4.9% reductions annually into 2030. Um, again, this has been welcomed by many, but parts of the reform have to gain either coalition or Senate crossbench approval. So we expect negotiations and, you know, some potential changes in the consultation period that's now in place. Um, but in terms of what this means immediately for carbon projects, and it's something that we will keep everyone abreast of as we learn more from um, yeah, some of our uh, trusted sources on the analysis space, um, the Chubb review, you know, Rep Reputex, who are an important sort of market analyst, um, view ACUs as now being a lot more fit for purpose and suggest that the outcomes of the review will provide a robust price signal moving forward. And then coupled particularly with the safeguard mechanism reform proposal, this should trigger uh, what Reputex are describing as a structural train change in Australia's carbon market. Um, we, you know, hopefully when it, if and when it comes to pass, um, we should have a transparent emissions reductions trajectory, again, providing that, 
that signal, a critical signal this time for companies to reduce emissions or source domestic offsets. And that increased demand for domestic offsets should support higher ACU prices over the long term, which is, of course, good news for carbon farmers who are looking to access a revenue stream through undertaking projects. Um, there is a lot there. Um, we certainly aren't experts on a lot of it. We're quite focused on the outcome side of things in terms of the broader market space, but do have a look at our blog and we might have time for some discussion later on. Thanks, Berto. And I think in terms of um, broad strokes, in the build up to that Chubb review being released, there was quite a lot of negativity um, surrounding and casting quite a bit of doubt on, on carbon farming as a whole. But I think an important thing in terms of broad strokes looking at this is that like things like the Chubb review, uh, you know, reviewing and improving the processes of the industry that we're, that we're working in here and sort of improving the, integ the structural integrity of these these projects that we're delivering, which is an overall positive thing. I mean, they're quite complex systems to be putting in place and it's good that they're being, you know, updated and renewed. So that's, I think, yeah, there's definitely some positives to be taken away from that for sure. Yeah, I think it was Farmers for Climate Action that said at the end of the day, like the landholders are bearing the risks of these systems not being, you know, not functioning at an optimal level or not being fit for purpose. So it's good to see moves that are going to increase sort of investor confidence and, and landholder confidence in participation, we hope, although not without their critique, as mentioned. Not not perfect, but progress. Yeah. Progress over perfection. Cool. All right. Um, so here's just a couple of handy uh, recent resources that we thought you might find interesting while we're doing a bit of a recap. Um, so in terms of webinars, we're just doing a little bit of a, a self plug here. But some of the some of the webinars that got a lot of traction and had a, had a, um, we had good feedback on from last year. The first one was um, David Martin from Willamby Farms talked us through the ins and outs of running a side by side reforestation and soil carbon project um, as part of a, a mixed sheep and cropping enterprise in WA's wheat belt. Um, it was a hugely insightful session, um, and I'd highly recommend that anybody who's curious about first-hand experiences in running a carbon project, check that one out. Uh, we also ran one with Dr. Adrian Ward of Accounting for Nature, who ran us through their environmental accounting framework um, and how that's applicable to carbon farming projects. Another super interesting session, um, especially with biodiversity being such a hot topic of late around the globe, but especially in the ag and land management space. And then we had Sam Duncan um, from Farm Lab. He delivered a detailed insight into soil carbon baselining and um, for the team at Farm Lab, how they can help to make this process far more efficient, effective, and user friendly, as well as um, work quite symbiotically with the Carbon Farming Foundation model. Uh, in terms of articles, one of the um, great articles that we put out recently is how to calculate emissions. Um, this is a great piece which details the steps around measuring your farm's carbon footprint and outlines why it's a really great place to start your carbon farming journey. Uh, there was another article that was put together by our outreach team called Five Tools to Simplify Carbon Farming. Um, this sort of outlines emission accounting frameworks, useful carbon farming guides, handy interactive maps, um, indicative desktop assessment portals, and handy smartphone apps, all of which can simplify and streamline your carbon farming journey too. And the third one there is Pathways to Carbon Neutrality and Net Zero Explained. This is just a nice little explainer on how the nuts and bolts of carbon neutrality and net zero work from a policy and market perspective, as well as how that relates to carbon farming and how the Carbon Farming Foundation can help you. Um, just so we're not plugging only ourselves, there's a, there's a few other really handy tools out there as well. Um, the first being the Primary Industries Climate Change and the Climate Challenges Centre, the greenhouse, their greenhouse accounting framework. It's been touted as one of the best tools currently available to Aussie landowners for calculating the carbon footprint. So it's well worth having a squiz at. Um, we go into a little bit more detail on that in uh, how to calculate your on-farm emissions article. Um, the Farmer's Handbook on um, Carbon Farming Management is also a really good one. That's a collab between AgriFutures and Carbon Count. And that's a really useful tool for understanding the lay of the land of carbon farming in Australia. And it, it, it provides a lot of detail on methods that sit outside the scope of the services that we offer here at the CFF. So it's definitely worth a look. Uh, and the third one there is the CSIRO's report on Australia's carbon sequestration potential. And that's a really interesting read for anyone who wants to build their technical and scientific understanding on the basis of sequestration activities. 
which um, these carbon farming projects that we work with are all based on. Um, also, just a reminder to subscribe to our um, to our newsletter and to our education and to have a look at our education hub because there's all this fantastic content and more coming out weekly. Awesome. Um, so yeah, there's some sort of broad updates, I guess. Um, and then yeah, to turn, I guess, back to CFF and our new services model, um, just by way of a quick recap, we're a registered not-for-profit. We're about two years old, I think. Is that correct, Toby? <laughs> I've been around yeah, for well, a year and a bit. Bit, bit. bit more than two years now. It's I think we're October more. 2020. Yeah. Oh, wow. I need to update this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> two, and a, two and a half. Where's my mouse? Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, so our office is in Margaret River for the very lucky people that live there. Um, but we have staff and projects Australia wide. I'm actually based here in Melbourne, and we have some other staff in um, New South Wales as well. Um, so we're focused on, as I mentioned, reforestation, plantation forestry, and soil carbon methods. Um, just finding those to be of um, particular interest, I guess, to some of the um, landholders that we work with in the wheat, sheep and high rainfall zones and also kind of tending towards slightly smaller projects that were ill-served by the existing developer model that tended to be focused a bit more on things like um, human-induced regeneration and some of the sort of bigger, broader scale methods. Um, and so we've been focused on making carbon farming simpler and cheaper, aiming to overcome some of the challenges in the sector, which are that it's confusing and difficult to grapple with um, exactly what's involved in carbon farming, eligibility, feasibility, these kinds of things, let alone running a project. Um, you know, where landholders uh, have been able to participate, they may not have had as much control or understanding of their projects as they might like. Um, in some of the models uh, under which services are delivered, um, big developers will kind of take quite a holistic um, approach to delivering all the work and in return taking a large chunk of credits. Sometimes this works for a particular context. We don't mean to suggest otherwise. We're just looking to offer a different option. Um, and then in turn, because of these challenges, there's a lack of access for projects on the smaller side where things may not be so financially viable as a result. Nice. I think that's it. Um, and yeah, so some of our early bird um, partners and some that are a, a little more new actually as well on this slide. Um, uh, yeah, so that their logos are here. I think we managed to get customers that have logos in kind of an aligned colour scheme, which is really useful. Looks good on a slide. <laughs> Just being an idiot. Um, but no, we feel very lucky to work with these um, companies who are really focused on um, driving sustainability in their business models. Um, we also run projects with um, smaller landholders and those who like to fly under the radar who aren't featured on this slide. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's great to see projects emerging across the country um, in sort of broader sectors and, and um, yeah, moving into different spaces and concerns in terms of sort of sustainability, carbon neutrality, revenue, diversification um, and strategic integration of projects. It's also great to be building such strong working relationships with with a lot of these clients um, who, who started out with one project and now, um, you know, off the back of a successful implement, implementation of one project, um, moving into another one. And we're just sort of like getting to know each other and, and working through that and, you know, changing up the process as we do so to, ma to make it easier and even more streamlined, which is, you know, hugely valuable to us and, and to them. Definitely. Oh, um, so that takes us to our new model, which is, um, you know, stepped up from from our already fairly flexible model. Um, but our, our new model around Vailing today is uh, based on the following principles. Um, the first being that farmers keep 100% of their carbon credits. Um, previously, we did take like a little bit of a percentage of, of the credits, and we sort of looked at that as a, a skin in the game. A, you know, a little fee to show that we're 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 in it with them, with with landowners. Um, but we decided that it, it it's just it makes far more sense for us to just leave 
um, farmers with maintaining 100% of their carbon credits. They have 100% um, control over the carbon credits they do generate. Um, and we're opening the gate for farming businesses to get closer to carbon neutrality that way. And um, yeah, the next one is no smoke and mirrors. So we've got a totally transparent fee structure that outlines all the fees and costs from the get go. Um, we're here to try and make things simpler. Um, we look at ourselves as, as carbon project facilitators. So we're just trying to map out the simplest process possible um, and helping to smooth out that process wherever we can. Um, giving farmers a choice is another really big one. We're giving the farmers the freedom to choose um, only those of our services that are best suited to their project's goals, scale and budget. Um, and so you can tailor it however you see fit um, and not just from the from the outset, but throughout throughout the lifetime of the project, which um, Bert will get into a little bit later on. Um, we also have no lock in contracts, so there's no obligation to continue with our services at any time throughout the project. We have a, a very flexible um, cancellation policy. Um, this new and more flexible fee model is actually made possible thanks to our philanthropic donor um, who's seeking to just drive maximum impact in this in this sector um, and his contribution to the CFF equates to $98 per hectare established. Yeah, so I'll pass that on to you Berto to chat through what this change means and why. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, as Tobu was kind of getting at before, getting um, practical experience with a number of diverse um, landholders in terms of what they were looking for from a service provider has allowed us to um, adapt our offering to suit more landholders, we hope. Um, and so, yeah, we've kind of made some key changes in terms of um, getting rid of our credit share, offering more flexible service provision, um, shorter term um, engagements for service delivery and making voluntary cancellations simpler under our contracts as just sort of four headline areas. So um, just for the first example, as Toby mentioned, we used to take a small um, credit share. Um, now landholders keep 100% of the credits. We do need to charge more to set up the project accordingly, just to um, you know make things stack up financially at our end. Um, but this does mean that landholders have um, maximum ACU access in terms of that revenue stream or other objectives they might have with the ACUs. Um, so yeah, this is just responding to our, our customers wanting to access as many credits as possible. That's often why they come to us in the first place because they aren't a fan of the big developer model where a larger chunk of credits is taken from the project. Um, and it's becoming increasingly important where carbon neutrality is the, is the aim. Um, and so just to sort of give additional context, if we assumed revenue from the sale of ACUs, then by removing our credit share and increasing our fees, um, it's usually a similar outcome or a net benefit financially on the project, particularly with greater project scale or where a customer might be um, quite bullish on sort of the long term carbon price trajectory um, if they're doing their sort of carbon market research and think that things might um, increase. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's, I guess that's the first point. Um, in terms of service uh, provision, um, so yeah, we, we've kind of worked under offering sort of package service options previously, economy standard and premium. We do still sort of highlight what's possible under these three categories, just so people have kind of a sense of um, what's involved in, a, in setting up a carbon project and how much things might cost. But we now have a fully flexible um, quoting process, yeah, where landholders can um, choose what is needed according to their capacity, um, which really opens up the scope for them to drive cost savings. Um, as an example, um, we delivered set up services under a standard package for one customer for their first carbon project, um, and they were very um, to be transparent, they were very carbon literate already. Um, and then they became deeply engaged in the project, learning as much as they could. Um, so following this experience, they registered a couple of more projects, this time with a modified economy package, um, whereby they collated and submitted their own project registration with a budget for our time to support them. Um, so in this instance, they only paid for what they needed. Um, and this particular experience with this customer and similar experience just contributed to our modified thinking around service um, flexibility. 
Um, so we've always been big on no lock-in contracts, but the nature of our credit share um, arrangement did mean that there was um, an increased um, sort of likelihood of maintaining long-term contracts um, just because we needed to sort of keep deducting our credit share over the life of the project, so the 25-year crediting period. Um, but we just sort of found that this didn't really account for changing circumstances, such as a landholder's increasing ability to undertake compliance work in-house, uh, or also the possibilities of changing tech or capacity, um, things like what Toby was mentioning with those soil um, innovation grants. You know, there's capacity for less and less um, third party involvement and more and more landholder autonomy. Um, so our fee for service model provides that greater flexibility in terms of contract management as well, um, without the burden of any sort of credit share obligation to us over time. Um, and yeah, we also just made our cancellation 14 days um, rather than a month as well. Not that that's super material, but you know, a bit more, uh, yeah, option to pivot there. Mm. I think, yeah, we sort of like think that this is it's just a common sense approach to carbon farming. It's sort of makes more sense for everybody. And particularly when you think about um, the duration, the lifetime of these projects, they're long-term long -term projects. And so we want to we want to make sure that um, we're setting landowner minds at ease as much as possible. And um, yeah, just trying to make that just a simplified and streamlined process as much as possible. Oh, are you good on this slide, Berto? Uh, yeah, sorry, let's go. Sorry, I should be like over to you. That would be helpful, wouldn't it? <laughs> no. um, cool. So this is this is nothing new. We've we've chatted through this um, quite a few times before in terms of how how our model works. Um, but essentially, our, our delivery model is a it's a three way partnership. Um, uh, worth being really clear that this slide relates mostly to project registration and, and establishment only. Um, and there's only certainly scope for but there is certainly scope for additional partnerships in project scoping and aggregation of landowners also. Um, but back to the delivery, our role our role as CFF is the carbon project facilitator in this partnership. So we're a remote support team that exists to make sure that the project follows the rules while optimising results, minimising risks and rolling things out in a logical streamlined process. So our services, as we'll get into a little bit later on, um, include eligibility and feasibility assessments, project registration and establishment support, offset reporting and credit issuance and other technical and compliance advice throughout. Uh, the landowner owns the project, provides the land, runs the farm as per usual, um, and coordinates most of the on-ground activities. Um, the, um, the, the relationships um, with contractors and CFF, and uh, they hold the relationship, sorry, with um, contractors and CFF and others. Um, then the third one is local experts. Um, these can be agronomists, foresters, NRMs, land cares, um, and they provide on the ground uh, locally specific services and advice for successful project delivery. So our DIY approach is all about harnessing local expertise when needed rather than taking on an um, expensive fly in fly out approach. Um, the landowner is in the driving seat of the relationship with the third parties there to support them um, and the CFF also there to support them and ensure that um, it's we're ticking all the boxes for a compliant carbon farming project. Um, for for instance, a local agronomist might advise of the best activities to build soil carbon at site, and the CFF can advise on any strategy compliance and regulatory implications or risks that that strategy might bring about, um, and then sort of suggest little changes where possible or workshop that change with um, with the two with the two other parties. Um, and work through how we might mitigate the risks in the project planning and design process. Um, we also recommend that landowners seek legal and financial advice as required or, or any other third party advice as it, as it pops up. And that could include sort of local government also. Over to you, Berto. Awesome. Um, so this is just like a little bit of info pulled slightly messily from our products and services <laughs> brochure. <laughs> Um, about our slightly varying approaches to supporting the different methodologies that we work in. So um, for reforestation projects, this the, the farmer approach probably changes more than in any other context, depending on farmers' capacity to either 
outsource or internalize um, site prep, um, uh, yeah, like seedling propagation and tree planting. Um, and, you know, where that capacity doesn't sort of exist within the landholders, um, yeah, own, um, I guess, machinery or capacity or space, et cetera, um, CFF can link to um, delivery service providers um, and also to foresters who um, will generally be involved no matter what approach you take in terms of um, helping um, to to hone in on a design strategy and species that will um, help deliver a compliant project in your particular context. Um, but CFF is always there to ensure compliance as well. Um, for a soil project, um, here we work closely with um, agronomists or others with um, that sort of particular expertise, helping farmers to come to a compliant and successful strategy around building soil carbon. Um, the other big third party role in a soil project is um, baselining and ongoing soil sampling. So we um, work with some trusted third parties there um, and can, depending on the landholders' needs, they might want to take this on themselves and we can support, but we will often, um, yeah, uh, liaise with third-party contractors to optimise uh, quotes for stratification, mapping, sampling, a uh, baseline sampling as well. Um, and then for plantation forestry projects, which are a little bit different, again, um, CFF focuses on the carbon aspect of a commercial timber project. Um, so uh, it's planning and, and carbon compliance focused, everything to do with the project registration primarily. Um, and the customers will then manage the plantation and forestry processes and, of course, the commercial sale of the timber, which is fairly unrelated to the carbon side, um, in-house or via a third party. Done. Oh, um, so this is a bit of an indicative project timeline. It's a, a very top level overview of the stages of a, of a carbon project, whether that be one of our soil carbon projects or um, native reforestation or plantation forestry. Um, but essentially, you can see that we, we break things down into a simple step by step approach with optional levels of support um, provided throughout. Uh, as you can see through stages one and two, we are focused on understanding the feasibility of your potential project and doing all the required due diligence that um, is involved. From there, we can put a contract in place and march on into the setup services. Um, this involves all the necessary plan planning, mapping and administrative tasks prior to implementing the project, whether that be planting trees or implementing new soil carbon building management practices. Um, and then once our project is established and up and running, we can then shift gear into our ongoing suite of services. Uh, this involves maintaining your carbon stocks, ensuring that all the monitoring, reporting and verification is up to scratch and managing any carbon credits that are produced as a result of the project as you see fit. Um, and as mentioned earlier, you may well decide that you are a fully competent carbon farmer by this stage and choose to strip the services you require from us um, right back from in those ongoing services. Um, so it's fully tailorable, as we mentioned earlier. Do you have anything to add in there, Berto? Or happy to go yeah, to the next slide? That's fine. The next slide's a bit of crossover, isn't it? It is. Lots of colour. <laughs> yeah, just a different way of presenting that, I suppose, with a bit more focus on the services that we provide. Um, so we've got scouting software. It's currently built for reforestation projects, but we've got hot on the heels now with a new sort of... Um, platform called Carbon Scout. Um, it's going to be built for plantation forestry and soil carbon as well in the first half of next year. I'll speak to that again a bit later. Um, so yeah, that, that's like a free a free software product that helps with the initial scouting of the opportunity in terms of yield and um, feasibility. We then offer, offer more sort of comprehensive um, eligibility, suitability, financial and risk analysis with specific recommendations. Um, we can do this via a presentation or a report. The report might be particularly useful um, to present to eligible interest holders like banks or perhaps if you're looking to gain local government approval just to show that you've done your due diligence and can show the sort of financial side of the project stacking up. Um, 
So once the project, once you've assessed feasibility, you know, funding's been obtained and stakeholder approvals gained, as mentioned by Toby, then we move into setting up the project through design and planning, um, which is more of the sort of paperwork side of things and, and prep, getting the um, project rego lodged and approved, and then through to the implementation, which is actually um, undertaking the change of practice on site, whether that's planting trees or changing um, agricultural practices to build soil carbon. Um, we'll go into that in a bit more detail on the next slide, I think. Um, and then, yeah, ongoing project services. I think we've touched on that a couple of times, so I won't go into any more detail. And throughout a project and to anyone who's looking just, you know, in terms of interest at this stage, we also have our education hub, as also mentioned. Mm. I reckon cool. next slide, Tobes. Beauty. I think, and also, I think you mentioned scouting software was due in the first half of next year, but it's where um it's actually almost ready to ready to rock now. It'll be the first half of this year. We're in 2023. It's already a month in, and I'm still in 2022. There you go. <laughs> um, next yeah, slide, please. Are, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, cool. So this is just a reforestation example of setup services, just to give a bit more contact context into what we mean by things like project registration and project establishment broadly. Um, so yeah, as always, as, as CFF has always done, um, we provide templates that can support you to take more of a do-it-yourself approach to certain aspects of the project, including approvals and plans and um, yeah, liaising with stakeholders. Um, for both registration and establishment. But then, yeah, registration is focused very much on putting all the documents together to um, submit to the ERF to uh, have them consider a process and then hopefully give you the tick of approval so you can commence your new activities. Um, parts of this include um, those local and state government approvals as required, boundary mapping, registering yourself or your entity as a proponent or client, and then the actual registration um, submission itself. For project establishment, um, we, I mean, we, we've popped under here our detailed work, project work, work plan, but that kind of over provides oversight of every part of um, the setup project with every, all the sort of key deliverables spaced out with key timeframes so that we can ensure that we're keeping on the critical path to your um, implementation date. Um, but we also do, um, yeah, su su support with um, project planting plans and, and layout cost optimization. We do an emissions baseline calculation um, just to sort of establish the, the commencement point for carbon sequestration. Um, there's options for um, us to provide and verify and optimise third party quotes for specific activities depending on the project type. Um, support with site inspections to ensure that um, the full breadth of advice is um, obtained on a site visit and you get great bang for buck, not only on how to um, yeah, deliver a successful project, but a compliant one. And then just um, yeah, opportunities for additional problem solving advice and coordination support where there are projects with greater complexity, which may include projects with sort of multiple holdings or multiple stages, um, or just um, when you're going into running a project for the first time and just want an initial buffer of time to help with issues as they may arise. Um, and so the key differences in the packages, if you haven't already um, sort of figured this out, is that for the economy package, um, the proponent does their own project rego submission with our support. Um, local government approvals are handled under both the economy and the standard option. Um, local government approvals can sometimes be a bit more of a drawn out process than landholders may realise. Alternatively, their local council may take more of a tick or flick approach. It kind of depends and that um, context can help assist with what support you might need from us in that space. Um, and then the big difference um, between economy and standard and premium in terms of establishment is very much around um, working with third parties and ensuring that you get best value from them. Um, and then the time spent um, for standard and premium having greater allowances for support from us in general. So as mentioned, these are kind of like three broad categories. 
you absolutely can pick and choose what services you need in those you don't we can also quote for additional work outside what's contained in the table um, or quote for additional um, support if it turns out you're kind of bitten off more than you can chew and need a bit more help later on thanks james Cool. So um, just to run through a couple of examples that highlight how our service offering can be tailored to suit your project needs um, as sort of within the um, that table that Bert just ran through. Um, in this example here, we um, have a project that we worked on and are currently still working on with uh, Proten, who are a leading broiler chicken provider in Australia. Um, they have sustainable operations as a core value um, to them. Um, this project was a 200 hectare biodiverse native reforestation project in the Riverina um, region of southern New South Wales. Um, it has a, yeah, a key focus on biodiversity um, and so that was sort of one of the things up front that we needed to sort of help them to support, help to support them through. Um, so what that sort of meant, oh sorry, we, they were sort of a, a more of a premium package as well. So on, on the right hand side of that table that um, Bert was just chatting through. So we helped them with their feasibility assessment, work plan and critical path oversight, open access to our range of templates and resources. Um, we supported them with local government approvals, um, which, which there was a, a few hoops to jump through there. Um, compliance and technical support for project registration was quite a big one with them. Um, and they we dived quite deep um, with an extensive local cost verification, vetting and quote sourcing and connecting with trusted local forestry specialists, as well as um, other third party specialists to navigate um, you know, the, the cultural heritage and the local flora and fauna element, like the biodiversity element of that project. So that was one element of where we sort of beefed up um, that part of their package. Um, compliance support for their site inspections throughout the project um, and then they required quite in-depth problem solving support and remote project coordination support throughout the project delivery. So that they were sort of up that towards that 60 hours end um, and also included a post planting plan review. Um, and then another project that we worked on um, and are currently still working on over here in um, the wheat belt in WA is on Willamby Farm. Um, that was a it's a mixed livestock and cropping enterprise in WA's wheat belt um, and they were set up an integrated soil and native tree carbon project on a mixed cropping enterprise um, the purpose of their project was to show the viability of carbon farming in a low rainfall area they get less than 600 mils um, while operating a profitable mixed farming operation um, and the, the whole crux of their approach is based on regenerative principles. So they're looking at things like building up um, soil biodiversity to build soil organic carbon, multi-species pastures and crops with pulse grazing, active water management um, and 100% ground cover, minimal tillage, minimal chemicals, all, all that regenerative jazz. Um, so what we helped them with, they, they, were, they have an active um, an engaged farm manager on the ground and, and David Martin, who I mentioned earlier, who delivered the um, the webinar presentation with us is quite active himself. So they they sort of opted for a standard package and um, were able to pick and choose parts of our offering, um, working around what they were able to tackle themselves because they're quite active in um, rolling out these carbon projects. So we helped them with a feasibility assessment with um, contributing to the work plan and the critical path oversight. Um, again, open access to all of our education hub um, resources and templates. Um, we helped them with compliance and technical support for the project registration um, and sort of helped to um, navigate local local council, local government um, tensions. Uh, we did local cost verification, vetting and quote sourcing, plus connecting them with local forestry specialists, some co compliance support for the site inspections and um, some problem solving and support through the remote project coordination or the project delivery, but, but far less as they were on the ground and managing a lot more of it themselves. Um, and David's key insights, as he mentioned in that webinar, were to, you know, to be prepared to change um, from the outset, be, be ready to make some big changes. So change of mind before, like change of mindset before um, making the changes on, on the ground. Um, to start planning early with our feasibility assessments, getting your head head around all the requirements, um, to outsource the assistance um, where where it's not within your own skill set. So, um, in their case, it was to get us on board to help with you know things like 
like the administration and compliance side of things, which weren't weren't so much their bag, but are certainly ours. Um, and to not give away the upside. And so he was talking about essentially profitability there and um, going with a model like the CFS one that doesn't give away all the carbon credits that they're working so hard to generate. Uh, I think the next slide. Uh, cool. So um, ex that takes us into other exciting things that the CFF has on the horizon that we're working through. Um, I'll take the first one and then hand it over to Berto to run through the rest. But um, we are currently working on something called the Broadacre Pilot Program. Um, this is because there's there's currently no carbon credit methodology that's well suited to cro uh, cropping enterprises in Australia. Um, you're having to sort of um, navigate juggling multiple projects like David Martin and the Will Ambie team are, in, as I mentioned on that previous slide. So uh, we here at the CFF are evaluating the possibility of introducing a Broadacre Pilot Program, which is a essentially a research project to evaluate the possibility of providing feasible opportunity for broad acre cropping enterprises to participate in the carbon market more easily. Um, we're currently, we're first looking to establish a, the pilot project in WA with a mind to scale it out Australia wide if it's feasible, but this is still in the very early days and um, we'll be sure to keep everyone posted on any developments that do happen in that space. So yeah, I suppose watch this space. I'll hand it to you there, Berto. Hi, uh, yeah. Should I crack on with some of the rest? Um, yeah, for sure. We, <laughs> we've all already mentioned the Carbon Scout um, product that's going to be released in the first half of this year. Um, just to resummarize, that's a scouting, I like the carbon yield scouting and feasibility tool that's going to be applicable across our three methods. Um, so just, yeah, relatively simple to input some assumptions and then sort of understand yield and financials by clicking through with a few buttons. Um, it'll be facilitated in the first instance, but we hope to make it so intuitive that it can be um, yeah, undertaken without support at a later date. Um, the focus then will be on building out, continuing to build out our, our project management software. So looking to tackle chunks like streamlining the rego process, the project registration process with potential for an API link up to the clean energy regulator. Um, who facilitate emission reduction fund, um, as well as project management focused um, functionality to streamline um, documentation and data management in an ongoing um, manner for MRV for, for projects. Um, we are continuing to work on funding solutions. So um, this is all sort of coming down the pipe, but it's probably just worth saying that if there's like concerns around funding, it doesn't need necessarily be a barrier to your project. Um, we're working with different providers and can workshop a solution with you if you have a, a hot prospect of a project. Um, we also, a, a little further down the line, um, will be working on vetted carbon trading opportunities. So when those credits are issued after following offset reporting, um, There'll be plenty more learning and education resources on our Edu Hub and in our webinars. And speaking of which, Toby, you've got an exciting update for Feb's webinar. Yeah, we do. We've we've just locked in a um, an exciting guest for February's webinar uh, next month with um, Noongar Land Enterprise. Um, who they're based over here in WA and making some really great waves in the um in in the land management space in terms of um advancing First Nations people's um incorporation and like yeah they're they're um yeah working in the land management space um and this this webinar will be based on incorporating first nations um knowledge into carbon farming projects as well as walking through all the services that they they do deliver in the carbon farming space they they operate a nursery and do offer um rehabilitation services so lots of tree planting services seed collection services um and yeah they've got some really great insights to offer so we're really looking forward to that one yeah that'll be fantastic looking forward to it too um awesome so i don't know that we have any questions in the chat yet but i'll keep an eye on it we do have some pre-submitted questions which we can touch on briefly um so yeah there were some questions that i hope have been answered by the content today um but yes feel free to, to jump into the chat if not um, but in terms of um, others that were maybe sort of slightly out of scope or, 
yeah, just worth sort of touching on. Um, Dale asked um, what's involved in the process of running a carbon project, who, how, what, when, et cetera, risks and liabilities. Um, I will follow up with Dale because we have some quite useful resources with more detail on running um, projects under specific methodologies like project guides and the like, which will probably get to the level of detail um, that, that is sought there, um, as well as some useful blogs on risk mitigation and management too. So I'll flick those through to you, Dale. Um, Kayleen was wondering about what the minimum size um, property um, would be required for a project. Um, I, I guess I'll answer this more on like minimum project size and you can maybe do the maths on how that might work within your own property. Um, but viable project size really uh, depends on a number of factors, including your objectives, your opportunities to drive cost reductions, um, any funding or support you might receive. There are quite a lot of funding programs out there lately and more are sort of coming online all the time. Um, and of course, the carbon yield that's possible at your site, that's a big one because that drives profitability substantially. Um, of course, fixed hectares over, uh, or fixed costs rather, over more hectares achieve better economies of scale, which is also um, important. So with all that in mind, um, for most projects, we do suggest native reforestation projects, maybe over about 100 hectares, soil carbon probably over 1,000, plantation projects probably over 200 but it's possible that projects can be feasible at smaller scales, depending on all those factors I just mentioned. So, yeah, please do get in touch with some more details about your potential project and we can help you assess your opportunity. Um, Michelle had a question about how to match sequestration methodologies to current land parameters, e.g. if land is inundated and salt affected. Um, you know, would this mean that revegetation and or perennial pasture um, activities may be effective? You know, should you exclude stock or limit grazing? How can you limit costs to implement the project and measure the project? Those are all really great questions and I think answers are probably multi-prong. Um, in terms of um, successful sequestration strategies for your particular context, uh, you know, you may have got a bit more of a sense from this presentation around CFF's compliance role. Um, so we would recommend seeking the advice of local experts, be they foresters, agronomists, or perhaps your sort of NRM and land care might be able to give you some useful advice as well. Um, opportunities to reduce costs certainly exist, um, particularly under more modelled methods um, with DIY opportunities. So, for example, you know, you spoke about, or you mentioned revegetation. So, a native reforestation project does offer opportunities to reduce costs via undertaking some of the um, plantation establishment yourself. Um, you also avoid the greater ongoing measurement costs um, for something that you would that you would see in a project like a soil carbon project. Um, because the method is modelled, so it's a bit easier to sort of report and verify and therefore reduce costs. But as Toby mentioned as well with innovation in the soil space, we do expect cost savings um, with increased sort of remote measurement tech um, across all methods over time. So the space is continuing to change and we hope to see cost efficiencies continue to emerge. Um, I'd also say if you have capacity um, to put in some time, for example, around gaining any local government approvals that are required, managing some or all of the registration paperwork with support, um, and even things like keeping really meticulous records of your implemented strategy, like these can all um, help reduce expenditures on third parties, either at setup or in ongoing management of the project too. Uh, but again, yeah, we'll just encourage you to seek local advice and to yeah get in touch directly if you think there's a decent opportunity to build carbon and we can help you assess the um, the opportunity under a relevant method. Um, I might hand over to you, Tobes, for the next couple. Yep, totally. Um, so do we is Mike Mike Kendall's not in the chat, is he? Um, don't don't think Mike Kendall's here, um, but he had a question around measurement and certification of non previously used trees, tree species to do with um with fodder trees. Um, we think this might be an HIR question, in in which case we would um recommend that he that 
that not being one of our um, our service offerings, we'd recommend getting in touch with you know local NRM or Landcare, um, and they can sort of direct you towards who might be the best service provider to help you understand HR projects. Um, but it is also true that fodder trees can be planted as part of your soil carbon project, um, so long as that they don't um, reach forest cover. So as long as they're not um, getting higher than two meters tall and um, reaching more than 20% crown cover. Um, but it's worth noting that you aren't actually credited for the above ground carbon sequestration of those trees, only for the sequestration that they put into the ground, um, into the soil. So that the same there goes for things like viticulture, like vines and um, you know other shrubs. Um, we had Yashpal. Um, he asked a question on the latest sustainable biochar techniques. Um, so. Making use of biochar is an eligible management practice uh, for soil carbon projects, but there is actually quite specific rules within the method as to how it can be used. Um, I think Yashpal is in the chat, so if you'd like to, um, we, I'll actually follow up with you after this after this webinar, Yashpal, and flick you some more detail on that um, in terms of how what the rules are around using biochar in a soil carbon project, if that is how you do wish to use it. But I'm afraid that. Um, the the detail around how you can actually eff effectively use biochar to to increase organic carbon that isn't necessary that isn't really our wheelhouse we're more focused on the compliance and and um you know the methodology navigation side of things as project carbon project facilitators um so we, I'd, I'd recommend you do seek expert advice i know that there is a lot um there's quite a lot happening in that space currently um but yeah once you do have someone who is able to help you to understand how to use biochar to maximize soil organic carbon and can sort of provide an estimate on how much you can build your um, soil organic carbon levels by then we'd be happy to have a chat about you know making that making sure that it's all compliant and um, modeling um, modeling the feasibility of a potential project under that soil organic carbon increase um, did you want to take that last one from helena there Better? Sure, yeah, yeah. Helena or Helena. We have a um, Helena or Helena in our office, actually, and I frequently call her either, and she seems to be happy with it, but it's not good enough, is it, <laughs> Um. So can you develop a project on an existing revegetation site, e.g. eight years old is the question. So probably not a native reforestation project is the answer in terms of the methods that we work on. Um, there is a no clearing um, period as well as a, um, a requirement that there not already be a forest um, on site in order to, to undertake a project under that method and a forest being um, trees on average of two metre height with 20% crown cover. Um, you also can't have existing woody biomass or if you do it would need to be sort of excluded and worked around in a way that um, you could still maintain viable project areas. So like the, the short answer is probably no. Um, there could be other methods that apply under the ERF. My hunch in is that there probably aren't, but um, there's like a handy resource on the ERF website. It's like a method flow chart where you answer certain questions and then end up at a place of either not being eligible or potentially a method applying. Um, but, but depending on the context, it may be that something like human induced regeneration might apply. Um, but my thought would be, yeah, just to have a bit more look on the ERF website and also to um, have a glance at the new biodiversity market. Um, it's still under development with the federal government, but there may be an opportunity there if you're able to show that through your sort of active management of the site, you're increasing biodiversity, even if it's an existed planted site. Um, and there potentially may be a look back period as well under the biodiversity market, but it's all being worked through. So sort of anything that's been released so far isn't set in stone until that happens. Um, but yeah, there could be opportunities to gain credits more from that perspective than the carbon perspective. Do you have anything to add there, Toby? Um, I suppose just also the resource that we mentioned earlier on in this presentation, the um, the Farmers um, on Farm Carbon Management Handbook, um, the one that was developed by uh, Agri Futures and Carbon Count. It's um, it, it's it, it is a really handy resource, and maybe um, it interprets interprets these methods a little bit better than some of the ERF res resources tend to. They can be a little bit jargony and, and quite 
yeah, very quite scientific. Um, and that flow chart can be a bit confusing, even even to us who have been working in the sector for a few years now. Um, so that that one, uh, there is a bit more to get through, but there's a better chance that you'll like un understand the ins and outs. So that yeah, I'd recommend having for that resource too. Yeah, great. Oh. Um, there's no, no more go. questions. <laughs> Sorry, you go first. No, no, you're right. Continue. Sorry, I was just gonna see if I could find that flow chart really quickly, but. Yeah, I, suppose, um, I can follow up with Helena later. Yeah, does anybody, uh, Yashpal or, or Helena um, or Mike, if he's joined the chat, any, anyone have any follow up questions based on our answers to those or are we, otherwise we're just about on time, um, so we can probably skedaddle. Yeah, we might have to take up any follow up questions by email everyone because we've kept you for an hour. Um, but thank you very much for joining us today. Please do let us know if you have any um yeah, topics that you'd like to see us cover, um, drop us a line if you have any project opportunities or, you, yeah, just like any questions answered and we'd be happy to help. Absolutely. Yeah, get in touch. Hello at carbonfarming.org.au. Awesome. Thanks very much, everyone. Have a good one.